We're going to jump right into the text this morning uh, in this series uh, through the book of Hebrews called Radiance. Chapter 1, verse 3 of the book of Hebrews. You know, we learn that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And we get to live in the light of his radiance. So we're going to go right into the text this morning, but as we do so, I want us to come with a, with a sense of anticipation, with a hunger, with a sense of salivating towards God's word, towards his promises, towards his instruction to us. What does Jesus say? Matthew 4, quoting Deuteronomy 8, he says that we do not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We don't live on hot dogs alone, on steak alone, on tofu dogs alone, on chocolate bars, whatever it is. The word of God, think of that anticipation that you feel before a Thanksgiving meal, before a Christmas dinner, before a dessert at a birthday. That type of salivation, that's our spirit as we approach God's word. It is alive and active. Right? That's what we've been learning. And so there's three words on the screen. Caution, counsel, and encouragement. And in today's text from the book of Hebrews, there is a word of caution. There's two strong words of caution. There's a word of counsel, meaning God's wisdom and his teaching towards us. There's also a word of encouragement, helping us and building us up. And because God's word is active and alive, and because we are his people... I'm inviting us to just very deliberately, as we approach the text, think today, what word is God specifically going to speak to me today? Is it going to be a word of caution? Is it going to be a word of counsel? Is it going to be a word of encouragement for this specific chapter and moment of your life? Okay? So what I'm going to do is invite you to pray with me as we open our hearts and minds to the specific word, that God might be speaking to you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It is alive and active. We know that we do not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from your mouth, so open us by the power of your spirit. For all the different things that we're going through and the struggles we're facing, Lord, you know what we need to hear So open and tender our hearts, whether it's a word of caution or a word of counsel about something or a word of encouragement. Open us so we hear what you need us to hear. Make us receptive soil in the footsteps of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we open up Hebrews chapter 5. We've been going through, we're going not through every section of text, but we're going through many of them. Hebrews 5, uh, verse 11, I'm going to start and uh, reading from the New International Version. And recall, as we go through those different sections, this first section is a word uh, of caution. Okay? So beginning at verse 11, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. So, much to say about this. About this, what is this? Well, of course, as, you, as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, recall that every section is connected to the section before. And we've just come through a section teaching about the high priesthood of Jesus. He is of the order of Melchizedek. So, he represents us before God, right? He is the one who provides forgiveness and restoration and peace with God. There's no end date or start date to his term. He has this eternal function, And so uh, he's the one who leads us into the very throne room of God's grace for grace, mercy, and help in our time of need. So that's what he has been talking about. That's the about this. And he will get back to that topic shortly. But he goes on a bit of a digression here in today's text. And his tone changes, and it's a bit of a harsh tone. Verse 12, in fact, and they're they're no longer trying to understand. So they're hard-headed. They're being stubborn, okay, apathetic, lazy, all those things. Verse 12, in fact... Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Pause, okay? So he's frustrated. They ought to be teachers, but they're not yet teachers. They're, they're, they're still kind of dealing with the ABCs, right? They're, they've been apprentices. Now they should be taking in apprentices. 
Now, but they're still kind of dealing with these things that they should be dealing with, and so he's frustrated about them. They're not grabbing the elementary truths, which are the ABCs. There's a famous basketball coach, John Wooden, and uh, one of the stories goes that you know, at the start of every season with these professional basketball players, grown men, stars, many of them millionaire stars, on the first practice of the new season, he would take them into the dressing room, and they would, uh, he'd sit down and say, all right, the first thing we need to learn how to do is tie our shoes. Like, of course, they know how to tie their shoes. They're grown men, but he's teaching a point. He's saying, we need to start with the basics. Before we can get on to greater things in a Christian maturity, we need to have a firm grip on these basics, what he is here calling the elementary truths. Now, what are these truths? What is that maturity? Well, he says certainly about the teaching about righteousness, which literally means word about righteousness. So there it could mean two things. It could mean just living in a way that is right, and just before God. It also could be a reference to the righteousness that we receive in Jesus, meaning that when we stand before God's throne one day, um, because of our faith in Christ, you know, God sees the accomplishments and the righteousness of Jesus wrapped around us instead of our own moral failure. So it's this wonderful, beautiful good news of of Christianity, of, of the gospel what Jesus has done for us. So it's a bit unclear. We're not sure which of those two categories he's talking about. Either way, they're not getting it. And he also says this other thing about Christian maturity, about solid food. First of all, we don't ever fully arrive at maturity. It's not like there's a finish line where we can say in this life, I've arrived, I've graded, I'm fully mature as a believer, right? It's kind of this constant work in progress. So that's one of the things. But also, having trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So part of maturity is learning and realizing that, yes, there is objective evil, there is objective good, and we need to distinguish between the two, and that can be difficult if we don't have those elementary truths, those basic ABCs, down first. Uh, In India, there are street cleaners, um, and I read this in a book called Jesus Speaks, um, Leonard Sweet, Frank Viola, and the street cleaners, but they don't clean the streets, even though they're called street cleaners, they don't clean your shoes, um, they come up and offering a service to clean your ears. Now, that's kind of weird. Like, I'm, like, if someone comes up to me on the street with a Q-tip, I'm going to be like, step back, right? <laughs> uh, but the idea is there's so much, in some of these massive cities, there's so much dust and gunk in the air that they come up, and just like, you know, in a downtown, you know, big city, someone might come up and shine your shoes, they'll offer to clean your ears, right? Because they're not functioning properly if there's all that gunk in there. And I, the connection I see is this, is that in our world, in our society around us, there is so much gunk entering our minds all the time that we need to distinguish, between, okay, what is gunk and what is godliness? We need to distinguish between the two. And that is a part of what it means to be mature, You'll never look at a Q-tip the same again. Okay. Now from that, so that brings uh, this first section about a word of caution to a conclusion. And what I want to say is that, is that a word of caution for you as well? Are you being lazy and not making an effort to learn the ABCs of the faith? And this is about being honest, okay? If that is you, you won't be able to learn more about God's righteousness nor will you be able to move on to that all-important work of spiritual maturity and distinguishing the difference between good and evil. So maybe there's some people here or at home, and that's the message that they need to hear out of this. Let's continue. Chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of... Okay, now he's going to recite to them some of the elementary truths, some of the basic ABCs, okay? So this is a section about counsel, about wisdom, about teaching. First, he mentions six things. First, repentance from acts that lead to death. So, okay, that's definitely elementary, right? The ABCs, okay, there is sin. We need to repent of sin, confess it as forgiveness of God, and recommit to his ways. Okay, that's what that's about. Next is faith in God. Yep. That's definitely a basic. We're here, right? Faith in God, trust in God. But it's one of those categories and things that we talk about or we say so often. It's like, what what is meant? Rodney Anderson has this great way of kind of highlighting an important understanding about faith and trust and loyalty to God. He said, there's a monumental difference between believing in God and believing God. A monumental difference between believing in God and believing God, right? 
I might believe in my neighbor. I know he's there. I know he exists. I know he's a nice guy. Do I believe him when he speaks, that what he speaks is good for me and for the people around me? Well, that's a different, th- that's a different story. One thing, believe in God. What about believe in God? That's what faith is in this context. Third thing, instruction about cleansing rites. Now, the original here is in the plural. It could be baptism. So this is probably a reference to uh, baptism-esque uh, rituals, either in Judaism or Christianity. The laying on of hands, he says. Okay, it's you know, a way whereby we appoint elders into leadership in the church. It could also be a reference to laying on of hands in prayer or to anointing people with oil, you know, as seeking healing from God that we read about in James 5. Could be that as well. Uh, the resurrection of the dead, which is surely um, in, uh, about Jesus' resurrection, but also about the resurrection of the righteous. So the resurrection of all people at the return of Christ at the end of time. And eternal judgment, which is about the fact that one day we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In Christ, some will be judged favorably, others will not be. And God permitting, we will do so. so we'll pause there for a second. Okay. So those are some of the basics that in their context was really important. They had learned about those things and they still weren't grasping them. Do those things continue to be important? Absolutely. But if we're seeking a word of counsel and we need these building blocks right, there also might be other building blocks that are essential to our faith that we just aren't grasping. And because we're not grasping them, we're not able to move on to a greater level of maturity. Okay, so um, what, what might some of those be? Maybe some of those will be you know, the fact that the physical resurrection of Jesus is central to the faith. Without the resurrection of Jesus, our faith is futile, the New Testament says. Uh, maybe it's about the fact that uh, God's word is inspired. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16. Maybe it's what the great command is. Mark 12, what is it? Well, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, your neighbor as yourself. Maybe it's when you come to believe in the risen Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts to work in and through you. Maybe it's the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. When we start to know about these things and pray about these things, that's when we you know, maybe become more aware of how God wants to work through us, right? So what are those basics, right? And part of the reason this is significant and important is because if you try to run before you can walk, you know, you could be going backwards. You could be falling backwards. If you try to run before you can walk, when it comes to Christian basics, you may be going backwards. And so the question is, is that a word of counsel that's something that you need to hear as well? Maybe it isn't. We're all different places. Maybe, maybe that's the word of the Lord to you today. Have you hit a roadblock on the path to maturity because there are Christian basics that you have yet to grasp? And so if so, you just got to take that honestly. Okay, what do I need to... What do I need to go back a little bit and re-examine before I can move on in maturity? Next, we're going to continue on with verse 4, and we're re-entering another level of caution. And this is even a harsher word of caution, or what seems like a harsh word. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Pause. So the idea here is that there are people, and, and this, is, this is kind of a... a a challenging passage to interpret who exactly is the group that is being discussed. I go into greater detail about this in the Pulse podcast that comes out um, in a little while. But here what I'll say is, I think the group that is being referred to is people who have done so much learning. They have come along. You know, they have, they have been keen. They have been eager in many ways. They have, experienced, they have seen the Holy Spirit working. They have come under the teaching of the Word of God, but in the end, they have rejected God. And as the text says, figuratively speaking, they have lined themselves up with actually the enemy of God. It's a shame that all that has happened and they have still rejected God. This is a harsh word against them. Verse 7, land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that reproduces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessings of God, the blessing of God. So that's good. So imagine like the rain is the teaching of God and, you know, the... The crop that comes out of the land, that's, that's evidence of God's working through you. That's really positive. And then a contrast comes up in verse 8. But land that produces thorns and thistles is a worthless 
B, in danger of being cursed, and C, in the end, it will be burned, which is surely an allusion to eternal judgment. And so this is, this is a very significant word of caution, of warning, of falling away. And um, maybe we know people like this. Maybe, maybe some of you. Maybe there's people at home, here or at home who have just been learning and growing. Um, they're not quite there yet. Um, and this is a word of warning or caution. Now, I just want to make a note about how some of these passages seem harsh. Uh, they're not as harsh as they seem. There are times when a loving heart manifests as growling teeth. There are times when a loving heart manifests as growling teeth. This is actually for our good. Um, I picked up a book. I just saw it, so I picked it up. A Little House in the Big Woods. So it was just kind of a nice light novel. Now, this is the precursor to all the Little House in the Prairie series. So before they moved to Walnut Grove and the whole thing, before the TV show, Laura Ingalls Wilder is writing these, these memoirs. So close to Christmas one year, these family friends come to their cabin. Pioneers had it hard. Wow, it's one of the things you learn about these, these books. Anyway, they have it hard, and this, this fam, friend, a friend of the family tells them this sto- weird story they had, experience in their own cabin at another part of the big woods. Anyway, the father was away. He was out hunting. He was in the bush. He had the gun. And Eliza, the mom, was going down to um, the spring to get some water. And as she went down there, she was there with the family dog, Prince. And Prince is calm, a nice family dog and everything else. But all of a sudden, at one point, all of a sudden, Prince became very agitated and, and started kind of growling. And he bit the back of her dress and started pulling her backward. And she's like, what's going on, Prince? And she's, she, this, she's totally not, not used to this behavior. And so he was gripping so hard that with his teeth, his sharp teeth, he ripped off a part of her dress. And she's like, Prince, what's going on? And she, she continues to move forward. He, he growls his teeth. He jumps around on the path in front of her, burying his teeth, growling at her. And she kind of gets scared, and he starts to kind of lead her back toward the cabin. I think, the dog's gone mad. I might actually kind of shoot this dog if my husband wasn't away with the gun. What's going on? And it gets her back into the cabin with the kids, will not let them leave four hours. What happens? Well, later the husband comes home, and they try to figure out what is going on, and they go down back to the spring, and ah, they realize there are massive panther tracks down by the spring. And they can see that the panther has been up in this tree on a huge branch over the spring, about to pounce down and kill his wife, Eliza. Possibly later than the kids. They realize, wait a second, the dog saw that. The dog (laughs) realized that and showed his gnarling teeth, not because he was harsh or being mean or because he had gone crazy, but because he was loving. There are times when a loving heart manifests itself as Gnarling, gnashing teeth. And that's what passages about warning and caution that come to us in scriptures because this is actually true and we need to take this very seriously. There are harsh words that seem harsh from Jesus, from Paul, from so many others. But it comes from a loving place. And so the question is, is that word of caution something you need to hear as well? Are you playing the part? Are you believing in God but not believing God? Will you continue on to Christian maturity or will you turn away? Even after all the distance you've come and instead align yourself with those who crucified Jesus. That's what the text says. Will your life produce a crop of God's blessings or will it produce thorns and thistles destined to be burned? Please let us find ourselves faithful in the first category. Final section of text. This moves into the third word, the word of encouragement. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. Now this is good. Now this proves to us that it really comes from a place of care. He calls them dear friends, a phrase that could also be translated as beloved. We are convinced of better things, better things than destruction. We know this isn't going to be you because you're going to be found faithful. The things that have to do with salvation, meaning redemption, meaning forgiveness and peace with God, both in this life and the next. God is not unjust. Here's that verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. 
Isn't that wonderful? Maybe they're discouraged, right? And we've talked in the previous week about how these people need to press on. These people, in this book written probably in the early to mid-60s, experiencing hardship and persecution, probably under the emperor Claudius. And they're struggling, and, 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 and they've lost some confidence in Jesus. They're not sure they can make it. We've just been reminded about that Sabbath rest of God, capital R, rest and peace, that will come at the end of our lives for those who are found faithful. Rest from fear, rest from hardship, rest from pain, anxiety, worry, woe, work, all that stuff. It is coming. Hey, you need encouragement? All that love and faithfulness and help that you're giving to other people? Don't you think, maybe you don't think anyone notices and because of that you're getting discouraged? No, God notices. God sees. Our God is a God of faithfulness, not forgetfulness. So beautiful. He sees those things that you do and I'm speaking right to all of you. Verse 11, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for, we've just talked about it, may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy. Don't be lazy. Harkens back to chapter 5, verse 11. Don't be lazy. But to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Now, I love this. This is a beautiful passage. You feel discouraged? You feel like you're in it alone? Number one, he's already shown us many times that we're not alone because of God. But also, look around at other people who are journeying the path. There are people around you who are faithful, who are going through hardship, who are dealing with this, who can be great examples to you. And when you see them, when you see what they're doing, it gives you motivation as well and you energy as well. This is part of the reason why the Terry Fox Run is so successful. Now, why do we get involved with the Terry Fox Run? Well, partly because most of us know someone who has been affected by cancer, passed away by cancer, or struggled, and so we want to be a part of the cure and all that. But also, we are inspired by the guy. He, he, he runs basically a marathon every day in severe pain. We're like, at least I can get out in the rain for a couple hours and do some laps, right? We see his example, and it inspires us. Here we are taught to imitate a certain kind of people, people who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Faith and patience. Remember a guy I played hockey with, he had this low center of gravity. He wasn't even that big, but no one could knock this guy over. Like, no one, no matter how big, they couldn't knock him over. His, his center of gravity was so down close to the ice They couldn't knock him over. And there are people in our lives like that. We need to look and find those people who have that low spiritual center of gravity and seek inspiration from them and imitate them. And what do these people look like? What are the traits we need to see and look for? Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Imitate them and inherit what has been promised. And so... At that last section of encouragement, we say, is that word of encouragement something you need to hear as well? God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. You have an audience of one. He notices. Be diligent so that your hope may be fully realized. Keep going. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit What has been promised just as you will. And so we end the text there. This is the word of the Lord. So at the start of this, I invited you to think about those three words. Caution, counsel, encouragement. And we prayed and we asked God to show us what we specifically needed to hear as the God who communicates with his people. Did you today hear a word of caution about something? A word of counsel about something. Another word of caution, that second one about something. Did you hear and need to hear and receive that word of encouragement? Whatever it was, respond accordingly. Amen.